Okay, well, welcome everyone, wherever you are. Uh, we've got a fantastic roll-up for this webinar, and I guess it demonstrates the interest that people have in the topic of unleashing the genius of every employee. And in particular, what we're looking at today in this short, sharp hour is three proven performance management uh, approaches. And uh, I have two colleagues here who I'll introduce shortly to you. Just a couple of logistics. Um, if I could ask you if you've got any questions or comments, if you look on the right hand side, go in and type them in when you think about them. So in other words, the way we can make this as interactive as possible is that if you've got a question that you want to ask and it's fresh in your mind, type it in there and I'll keep an eye out for that and I'll direct it to the person that the question's uh, best directed to. So if you could keep that in mind, we'll have a Q&A at the end, but I certainly would like to hear questions as we go through because we're covering a lot of content in this short period of time. The other thing is you'll receive a recording of the presentation and you'll also receive a slide deck as well. So you'll get both of those sometime this afternoon after the presentation if you want to review any of the information that we've gone through. So I guess we can get underway. I mean, engagement is, and it's been for some time, a very hot topic. I'm sure you're aware and I'm sure that's why you're here. So how do we actually engage the hearts and minds of our people is the question. So what do we need to do to unlock the potential of people that work for us? Where do we start? These are the questions we're going to be covering in this presentation today. Uh, we have three experts in the field with us and each will share with you a proven part of the performance management jigsaw. Okay, so I'd like to introduce to you um, the two gentlemen that will be working with me during this presentation. We've got Mark Shaw. Uh, Mark's going to talk about replacing performance appraisals with conversation notes and performance improvement plans with problem-solving conversations. Uh, Wally Hauk from the United States, and I believe it's about, uh, it's not too late over there, it's like 10.30 or thereabouts, that'd be too late for me, but never, nevertheless, welcome Wally. Wally's going to, uh, to talk about the complete performance improvement process and how it focuses on managing process and leading people. And I'm going to talk about the five conversations framework, which shifts the emphasis from performance appraisal to performance development. So you'll find there's a common theme running through our presentations. We're all on the same page in relation to this. And uh, you'll find that the themes will run through our presentations and our ways of approaching the dilemma of how to get the best out of people. So at this stage, uh, I'm going to uh, hand over to my colleague Wally in the United States and uh, give him an opportunity to present the complete performance improvement process. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you for uh, introducing us here, and uh, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, I want to uh, welcome everyone also. Uh, thank you for being here, and uh, thank you to Mark and Tim for organizing this. Uh, as, Tim, uh, as Tim was saying, we're all on the same page here, which means that we're sharing in the passion of replacing the typical performance appraisal. And so let me start out with a quick story. Uh, my book, Stop the Leadership Malpractice. How did I come up with that title? I thought I'd tell, uh, share a, a quick story with you. I was watching this movie. It's a 35-year-old movie with Paul Newman. It's called The Verdict. It was a, uh, a movie about an attorney who had some very hard times, was faced with some uh, serious, nefarious, events in his career and he was really downtrodden and became an alcoholic and he was faced with this case where there was clear malpractice of of a doctor uh, two doctors in fact 
that resulted in serious injury uh, of his client. And against all odds in the movie, I won't go into any detail, I encourage you to watch it, against all odds facing incredible uh, barriers to winning the case. He did, in fact, win the case, but the, 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 the chips were set up against him because the doctors were protected by this corrupt system. And boy, I watched that movie and I immediately thought, my gosh, malpractice. This is what leaders do every day in organizations. So I looked up the word malpractice. It's the failure of a professional person to do his or her job. And the fail results in some injury, and it's through ignorance or incompetence. I thought, yes, this is what leaders do when they when they use the typical performance appraisal. And so I immediately said, I've got to, I've got to write a book. I've got to figure out a way to get this message out. So again, I appreciate Tim and uh, Mark uh, uh, joining uh, here across the, uh, across the other side of the world. We're sharing this passion about uh, replacing the typical performance appraisal. Uh, the model that I like to use is that we have to start to think differently. An optimal leader has to think differently about performance management. They have to behave differently, and they have to use different tools. And if they're not doing that, then they're, uh, they could be considered to be having malpractice in their organization. So here's, uh, here's an example uh, that captures the essence of uh, of a different vision that we all, the three of us, have in mind. Which of these pictures best depicts your organization? Is it the hierarchical chart on the right, or is it more like an orchestra? And which one do we want? Do we want to be told what to do? Do we want to be controlled on the right in this hierarchical uh, control environment where it's hard to get things done, or do we want to unleash our talent uh, with every single employee to create beautiful music? Well, I, I know the way I pose that question, there's an obvious answer to it, that we want the orchestra, and I assert that the metaphor of the orchestra is a perfect metaphor for the type of organization that we would all love to work in, and the typical appraisal gets in our way. So when we think, we want to think differently, we have we want to create an environment for engagement. We don't want to try to control people. In fact, what we want to do, I assert we want to have a, more of a self-organizing system or a self-organizing uh, organization where people self-manage. In fact, don't, don't employees go home and they self-manage when they're home? You, you don't have to call, uh, uh, leaders don't have to call people at home and say, hey, did you have dinner? Uh, did you make sure you brushed your teeth? Uh, did you make your bed this morning? You know, they somehow are able to self-manage when they're home. Why can't they self-manage when they're at work, which requires trust and everybody to be treated like an adult? Yet the typical appraisal it treats people like children, and so we've got to think differently. We've got to think in terms of an orchestra instead of this hierarchical uh, organization that we've all grown up in and that continues to be uh, promoted and implemented. It's almost, uh, we're doing it unconsciously. It's, it's a level of incompetence that we've been taught that creates this malpractice. Uh, under behavior, we've got to behave with values. We've got to make. Uh, we've got to trust that people are going to behave with integrity and respect toward us, and that they're going to focus on improving their customer experiences, either internal or external. And we've got to be able to expect that they're going to behave with emotional intelligence. And if they are behaving with integrity and respect, focusing on the customer and emotional intelligence, isn't that when we can treat them like adults? Is not when we can treat everybody like adults, so that we can self-organize toward success and accomplishing the objectives that we want. Now, I'm going to share very briefly two tools. One calls the white. It's called the white flag, and then my replacement for the typical appraisal. And you'll see that Mark and Tim have very elegant replacements as well. Uh, and that is the purpose of this webinar: is to share three different types. Mine is called the Complete Performance Improvement Process, or CPIP. And uh, it, it's, it's the difference between a context of fear 
or a context of engagement. You cannot have full engagement if you have fear. On the left-hand side, I love this picture because it demonstrates that in many organizations, the leader of the organization, in this case the pilot, is taking the uh, employees in a direction that they don't understand at a speed that they are uncomfortable with and they haven't explained anything and it creates fear. Whereas in engagement, you have a totally different environment where you can be more like an orchestra. You can, you can really express yourself and as we said in the, the title, unleash. So the model that I like to use is called the values and system model. It's about focusing on the improvement of the interactions between people instead of what the typical appraisal does, it focuses on uh, evaluating the individual. And when you think about it, it's, it's a, a very simple shift. It's just not easy to do. Uh, you want to focus uh, on the interpersonal interactions between people. Uh, in other words, keeping agreements, being respectful, focusing on your customer. And uh, you want to work together as a team to eliminate mistakes, uh, eliminate poor attitudes, match skills and tasks with uh, what has to be done, uh, correct poor policies, uh, give better feedback, and uh, create this uh, productive environment that enables uh, people to be engaged. <laughs> so I consider that there's really two types of issues. There's something I call values issues, where uh, people either break integrity or they're disrespectful, or they're not focusing on the customer, or there are systems issues that are uh, caused from process or bad handoffs. And those systems issues or process issues can impact the performance of, uh, of an employee, for example. And in, so if something is impacting negatively the performance of an employee, it is so it's malpractice if you evaluate that employee and don't fix the process issue. I'll tell you a quick story. My, uh, my uh, flagship story is I love Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Now, in Australia, I'm wondering if you even have Dunkin' Donuts coffee, uh, but Dunkin' Donuts is a very famous brand here in the States, and, and uh, I always uh, order it whenever I can, and this um, – and for years, I would ask for a large cream, no sugar. Now, about 10% of the time, I'd get sugar, which I can't drink. So now I, I've, I'll go through the drive through I'll pay my money, I'll get the coffee, I'll drive away, I take a sip, I realize it has sugar. Now I, I'm out a, a couple of dollars, and I don't have my coffee, which makes me cranky, and I have to throw it away. Well, this one place did it to me twice in one week, and I was so angry. I, I rushed back. I'm, I was going to yell at the manager, yell at the clerk, and uh, ask for free coffee for the rest of my life. I was going to make a scene. Well, I had to ask myself the question, and this is what I want leaders to do. I had to ask myself the question, is this a values issue? Is this a break in integrity or disrespect by the clerk? Or is it a process issue? Well, Come to find out, what I have to do is I'm, I'm mentioning the word sugar. Why am I mentioning sugar? Why don't I just say a large just cream? So what have I done? I've changed my process as the leader, and therefore I can change the performance of the employees, which is in fact what happened. My mentioning sugar influenced the employee to have poor performance and to put the sugar in. Then uh, by, by eliminating the word sugar and saying just cream, uh, that's four and a half years ago, I have not gotten one bit of sugar in my coffee. Here's what leaders do that use the typical appraisal. They say word sugar, uh, the clerk performs badly, and then the leader evaluates the clerk. What I'm saying is we've got to start thinking differently about how the leader contributes to the environment which impacts the performance of the organization. And by evaluating the employees, 
we're missing that opportunity to change the system, to change the process. So the focus has to be on the interactions between the parts, not the f uh, focus on the parts. Uh, think about it. If you're going to buy a car uh, and you don't want to go to a dealership, what if, you, uh, what if you did this instead? What if you said, well, let me get uh, all the best parts from all the different manufacturers and I'll put them in a warehouse and then I'll hire some engineers to put them together. So I'll get the engine from Honda, I'll get the, uh, the chassis from Hyundai, I'll get the, uh, uh, the electrical system from uh, GM, I'll get the, uh, uh, the transmission from Toyota and I'll put it all in a warehouse and have the engineers put it together. Would it work? No. Why would it not work with the very best parts? of a car because it's the interaction between the parts that makes the difference and that's what we need to focus on it's a shift in focus and that's not what we've been taught so in this model there's two tools there's the white flag which is the international sign of truth so when there's a values issue when someone breaks integrity when someone doesn't keep their agreement or when someone is disrespectful when they have behavior that's uh, uh, unacceptable according to the standard, we can use the white flag and come to them and say, hey, excuse me, I, I need to give you some feedback about values issues. The other type of issues are systems issues, process issues, and this is where we want to use the learning cycle, and this is where CPIP comes in, where we're using the learning cycle to figure out what's the, what is the problem in the process when I say, uh, cream, no sugar. Oh, it's, it's the mention of sugar. Let's change that process and see if that works. That's the use of the learning cycle, the continuous improvement learning cycle. And that's what we want to do in organizations. Figure out a way to improve process and do it together as a team, like an orchestra, to make beautiful music. So why is CPIP, or the uh, uh, Complete Performance Improvement, a process so important because it optimizes the most important asset which is the people and it increases learning which becomes a strategic advantage. How does this work? Well, it improves the quality of the interpersonal interactions and uh, the quality of the systems interactions. And so it increases engagement and it involves everybody and it encourages self-management. If you have self-management, then the role of the, of the manager changes completely to one where he or she is adding much more value instead of being uh, an evaluator of people. The purpose of the CPIP is to create this environment that optimizes performance, makes best, the best type of career decisions necessary and possible for each individual, create accountability, trust, engagement, and, um, and performance. Uh, the differences between the CPIP and the old or typical, uh, these are the similarities. There's one-on-one -on -one meetings. There's a documentation and summary at the end. There's, the employee uh, completes a self-assessment, and there's at least one formal meeting each year. Uh, and there's an in-depth conversation, and you'll notice that uh, Mark has a series of conversations, and, as does uh, Tim, and they'll get into that as well. The, the key differences here, though, there's a simultaneous feedback about behavior for both managers and employees. Usually the typical is one way. Well, this is, again, a conversation going both ways. There's no formal grade, and there's a facilitation and accountability to agreements, not results. Because when you hold people uh, accountable to results, you can get unintended consequences. So it's all about them self-managing their own agreements. And it's proactive and forward thinking. It's not looking back in history and being a judge or uh, judging others. And the, the intention is to focus on trust and learning and to focus on the interactions, not focus on the people. So the manager then improves his or her behavior just as I improve my behavior by not mentioning the word sugar, I improve the performance of the whole department and the whole store because I changed. That's what you want. You don't want just the focus to be on the employee. You want the focus to be on both. So the manager and employee both improve their interactions 
you use data, not criticism, and you have open and honest conversations. So that's the introduction to the malpractice. That's how you avoid malpractice. And I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Tim now so that he can, uh, he can take off with his uh, uh, conversations. Thanks, Wally. That was fantastic. I, I love the way you talked about the difference between uh, values and system issues. And uh, I, I don't think enough organisations do this. Uh, perhaps uh, you might want to just uh, share with the audience, um, I, I think you did to a certain extent, but how you might uh, discuss a, or raise a value. Uh, or make the different, uh, you know, make the distinction between the two. Just, just in in a very practical sense, what what a manager might do. Sure. The the key difference for me between a values issue and a systems issue is an agreement. <clears throat> if you make an agreement, then you want to keep that agreement, or you want to let people know if you cannot keep that agreement. So, for example, we agreed to start. Uh, the webinar at noon Brisbane time and that's exactly what you did now if you you would never do this but if you just decided to you know have a coffee for 10 minutes and let people sit there they would wonder what was going on well that is uh, that's a values issue that upsets people because they're expecting us to keep our agreements so why not have everybody expect to keep their agreements. That's how an orchestra works. That's why when uh, people play at the same time in an orchestra, they're all keeping their agreement to play the instrument that they're chosen to uh, play, and they're playing the music that they're instructed to play. So by keeping that agreement, uh, they make beautiful music. If they don't keep agreements, it gets to be very noisy. Thanks, Wally. That's Tremendous. So, uh, you know, if you need more information on, on that approach, uh, please contact Wally. Um, I want to move on and look at another process. And as I said at the outset, there is a common theme running through all of these processes about the futility of evaluating and uh, uh, assessing employees. It's really a process of actually developing. And what I want to talk about here now is the five conversations framework. And I know Having looked at, looked at the vast attendance list, we've got a couple of people who are online today who are actually using this approach. Uh, hopefully I can add some value to it as well. Um, what you're seeing in front of you on your screen at the moment is you can see that there are eight steps in the process. So what I actually want to do is just lead you through, let's for example say that your organisation was going to adopt the five conversations framework. How would you go about that? And uh, what are the steps involved with that? So that's essentially what I'm uh, trying to do here. So step one in the process is that, uh, it'll come up on your screen, sure, there we go. Step one is that uh, we send you a template which essentially uh, requires the names and email addresses of everybody that's in the organisation. And that template we use for two reasons, and of course we protect people's confidentiality. But one of the reasons we use that is to uh, to populate a uh, website so that people have an online system or support system, as we call it. And I'll show you how that. Uh, I'll briefly show you that in a moment. The other reason is that we need to conduct some benchmarks. So we do some surveys up front to determine what the performance management culture is like in the workplace so that when we do this again later, uh, we can measure whether there's been any change. So that's why the template gets filled out. Um, and then step two in the process is that we actually uh, assess the current state. Now, this is, I know we're all we all have um, fill out many of these surveys. This takes uh, literally 10 minutes to do. There are 50 statements. There are 10 for each of the five conversations, but they're not directly related to the five conversations. But the idea is that uh, people will agree, disagree, or neither agree nor disagree with each of the 50 statements. And people have got an opportunity to write comments as well. 
But fundamentally, what we're trying to do here is to capture what the organisation is like at the start of the process. Because I think one of the criticisms that people have about some of the interventions that we're sharing with you is that it's very hard to quantify, it's very hard to determine whether or not it's been successful. So this is built into the system. So we, we collect that, we collect uh, that uh, data and then what we're going to use that data for, as I said, as a benchmark, but also for a little bit of learning as well. The next phase or the next step in the process is that um, we get the managers together. Normally or typically that's a bit less than a third of the organisation. People in any sort of supervisory or managerial role uh, need to do some training. So why are we doing the five conversations? What does it look like? What's in it for you? And why are we moving down this road and so forth? Now that's important. It's not a long session and for those remote, it can be done online through a process such as this as well. But we do the training. One of the things we cover in that session is the results from the survey in step two because we want, we, we want to start an organisational conversation around performance as, as it is in the workplace. So, let's, so we share some of that, we talk about why the results are the way they are and so forth. So that everybody's starting from a point of understanding why we're doing it, what the survey results are saying and what a person's role and responsibility is as a leader in this process. Some organisations uh, also uh, implement training for their employees as well. So that's a shorter session. The next step is that we then, um, everybody gets an email from me, uh, welcoming them to the Five Conversations framework. And they have their own portal where they can keep track of the conversations. And this portal has gone through a lot of evolution and change and we believe it's about, you know, just where it needs to be now. But it's really an adjunct to making sure that the conversations are occurring in the place, in the workplace. I mean, one of the reasons that just implementing a conversation culture won't work, I'd suggest, is that busyness will ultimately get in the way and people will just go back to doing what they've normally done. So it's important that we have some sort of system in the background to keep things on track. We then have a round of the five conversations and when I say a round of the five conversations, we're talking about five 10 to 15 minute conversations once a month over a five month period. Uh, so it's not, it's not onerous. Uh, some people are very concerned and suggest that uh, they don't have time for conversations, which in, its, in and of itself is quite humorous, isn't it, to think that people don't have time to talk to each other. Um, you know, I sometimes feel like asking, well, what, when will you have time or, you know, why don't you have time? But at the end of the day, the, the assumption is, of course, that it's not productive to be having developmental conversations, which of course it is. So we have the five conversations, one round. Uh, what will happen as a result of that round, you'll find, is that people performance will increase, but it, we can't measure that at this stage, but we can look around the office or around the, the plant, and what we'll notice is that people are talking more to each other, that trust levels have increased, that engagement's improved, that energy levels are higher. We see this, and this has been the feedback from uh, the process that we're using at the moment. So what happens then is that uh, we go through another round of the five conversations. So basically the ideal model is that every year we're expecting every leader in the organisation to have 10 10 minute conversations on development with, in, with their team members. And I don't think that's too hard an ask. And in fact, the good leaders, of course, are doing this anyway. They're just not labeling it as the five conversations. So it's not too hard to ask for that to occur. Some people are very skeptical and say, well, surely they couldn't go for 10 minutes. And if they did, what value is there? You can have a short, focused, 
valuable conversation. In fact, we encourage that, all three of us. You don't have to have a two-hour conversation, and not all two-hour conversations, of course, are productive. So it is possible, and the reason it's possible is that we give you the questions to ask. So you've actually got, you know, all that you all that you need in terms of the questions to be asked. Now, once we get to that stage, we can reassess the current state, or the change state, I should say. And what it does is it gives us a before and after snapshot of the organisation, and it can obviously hold us accountable. It can hold you accountable if you're in human resources. And so therefore you can actually quantify and show that there's been some changes in a number of different dimensions around performance, such as trust levels, as I said, or communication or engagement. So those things can be measured and should be measured. And that's what we should be measuring, not the particular employee, but how effective the process has been. And so then we go through the cycle again. So ideally that's a 12 month commitment. And some organisations really aren't ready for two rounds of the five conversations. And we just suggest to start with one round, which is five conversations over the 12 months rather than two rounds of five conversations. But uh, ideally it should be a regular ongoing process. So that, that's the process as such. Now, if I share with you the framework, so what do we talk about in these conversations? Uh, so you can notice there that on the, uh, it's on your screen now by the look of it, if you notice on the left hand side they've got five months, so this happens over a five month period. Some people say, well what happens between the two rounds? In other words, you've got ten months taken up and then you've got two more months. Uh, well, we, all, we, we recognise that businesses have peaks in their business of activity. Uh, we recognise that there are other conversations that you need to have and so we're giving you the opportunity and the space to continue that. Some people would, would say that uh, we don't want to get rid of our performance review or we can't. So you may use this as an, an enabler to actually improve a better performance review. So the choice is yours. But nevertheless, you'll notice that in the the topic column, we've got the five conversation topics there. There's a bit of thought gone into why I've ordered them as such, and I'll talk about that in a minute. A bit of the content about what occurs in the conversations and some of the key questions over on the right hand side. So um, the climate review is really, as it says there, looking at job satisfaction, morale and communication. And uh, the first question to ask in that conversation is, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being high, 1 being low, how would you rate your current job satisfaction? Now, you know, the, the team member can say whatever they like. They can say it's a 5 or a 7 or a 3 or a 2 or a 1 or a 10. Whatever they say, the next question, of course, is why. So it opens up a conversation around job satisfaction and then you move on to morale and communication. So it's a great conversation starter and it works really, really well. Uh, it, in fact, many companies spend tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on engagement surveys online which people really don't take too seriously. Why not do your engagement survey as a conversation in the workplace because you can record all of this information in your, in your portal and we'll talk about that a bit more. Strengths and talents is really about building and utilising what people's innate talents are. Instead of us going straight for the jugular and talking about what people's weaknesses are, which is what the performance review tends to do, let's talk about what people are good at and how we might actually exercise that strength in their current and future opportunities for development. And then the third month is probably the most difficult month, which is of course the opportunities for growth. So that's where we are raising areas that people need to work on. And uh, again, the employee comes to that conversation having already prepared themselves. So in other words, it's not just a case that the leader does all the heavy, heavy lifting. 
Now, out of the strengths and talents conversation in month two and the opportunities for growth conversation in month three, there's likely to be some learning opportunities that have come out of that. And conversation four is about learning and development. So this is a fundamentally around, um, you know, what learning would you like to undertake as a result of some of the strengths that you talked about and opportunities for growth. Now, this is not necessarily about sending people off to programs, although that may be part of it. But a lot of learning, of course, happens on the job in coaching and mentoring. Uh, a lot of it's unofficial. A lot of it's done in the corridor. So uh, these sorts of things can be discussed. And it might just be that the learning opportunity that comes out of your conversation might be around showing someone how to do something. So that's month four. And again, you don't have to go through a laborious process of doing a training needs analysis across the organisation. You've already done it through conversation and all of this is recorded on the online support system. And then we have innovation and continuous improvement. The fundamental difference between month four and five is that learning and development is around themselves, whereas in month five, innovation and continuous improvement is around the organisation and the workplace. So again, we're expecting people to come to that conversation with their thoughts and ideas about making the business more efficient and effective. So in a nutshell, there's the framework. Um, and uh, so if you want more information, you know where to find that. What you're seeing uh, on your screen now is a screenshot of the, the, uh, the online portal. Um, and what you're seeing there is uh, a uh, page for this person who happens to have uh, one, seven people in their team that they need to have conversations with. And there's a little dashboard that allows you to keep track of your conversations. So if you're interested in that, I'm more than happy to show you that online or in person. If you happen to be in Brisbane, I can show you how the system actually works. But of course, we don't have time for that today. I'm conscious of moving on, giving Mark plenty of opportunity to, to talk about his approach. Just finishing up before I pass over to Mark, um, you will notice here that there are five benefits to the five conversations. There's an ongoing dialogue. There's an openness and a directness that's not normally there in a performance review. It's flexible in the sense that it can be done on a park bench or in a car. It doesn't have to be done in the office of the leader or the manager. It's timely in the sense that it's done on a regular and consistent basis. And it's far more relaxed. So it allows a real dialogue and not just a monologue. So there are a lot of benefits to the process. So I um, just finish up. That's the book. Uh, you can get a copy of that book uh, if you go to my website or just send me an email. I'm happy to uh, um, sign that for you and send it out and you can get all the information you need on the five conversations framework. So pretty much I'll finish at that point and uh, pass over to Mark. And just bear with me. Hello, Mark. Good afternoon to everybody, or good evening if you're overseas. Um, thanks to, to Wally and Tim for, for their introductions and comments before. I'll move along fairly rapidly on my point, because we would like to leave a few minutes for, uh, for any questions at the end. But I just want to reinforce two comments that have been made already. One is we're showing everybody present today three different approaches and we're all talking about the same broad topic. Something's got to change. There has to be a systems thinking. There has to be a slightly different way of thinking. And it's all about what are we trying to do with the activity and with the data. And I'd like to cover three things today. I'd like to talk about a guy named Ken Miller from America and why performance management could be considered or should be considered a widget. I'd then like to introduce a concept that some of you are familiar with, the 2% effect, and indicate why that's causing problems in the performance management space. And finally, I'd like to give you some examples 
just to show you how things can actually work. Oops. There we go. So Ken, Ken makes this argument that everything we can do has to be, can be considered as a widget. And there are the four steps to what he considers a widget. The factory is, in his definition, where are the people and who are the people doing the stuff? So that can be a mechanic, someone making the coffee for Wally, uh, me preparing this PowerPoint presentation. The widget is the thing we do. And that can be a process or it can be you know, creating something like the pen or completing a form and having some approval process, potentially such as a manager approving a new recruitment, whatever. Third thing is that any widget produces an outcome. So in Wally's case, it was a cup of coffee ended up in his hand with or without the sugar in it. And the interesting thing is the last point, which is what I'd really like to focus on a little bit later, is who is the customer? And what's interesting here is Ken challenges us to think about the customer. And his definition is the customer is the person who uses the outcome from the widget. And I'm going to point out that I think sometimes in performance management, we don't understand who the customer is. But the big point and the reason I really like Ken's idea of widgets is he says, if you don't see it as a widget, then you can't see the system. And if you can't see the system, you can't improve it. So you've seen two ways sort of changing the way we could do the system to improve it. And I'd like to show you the third. The second concept for those of you that haven't caught up with me before is what we call the 2% effect. My good colleague, Di and I. And the 2% effect is the fact, and it is a fact, that we tend to create rules for a small percentage of people who break the rules. And there are two unintended consequences to this. One is that that small percentage of people break the rules anyway. They really don't care. And the second unintended consequence is by creating these fairly bureaucratic, complicated rules, it just gets in the way of the people trying to do the work. So I want to talk about performance management in the concept of widgets and the 2% effect. I'll just give you one very simple example of, of the 2% the effect, real case. The use of corporate credit cards. This happened in an actual organisation. For many years, they had a very simple rule. Treat it as if it was your own money. That was it. As the company got bigger, things became more bureaucratic. They introduced a much larger finance uh, process. And inevitably, someone overspent on the credit card. In fact, two people. So the response from the organisation was fairly typical in terms of the 2%. They introduced mill bureaucracy. They took credit cards off everyone. They made them spend their own money and then reclaim it back off the business. The unintended consequence was that the good people left and the two people that broke the rules stayed. And to introduce another concept some of you are familiar with, we call that killing Bambi. We're killing the good people by not dealing with the bad people. Now let me just talk about performance management for a tick. And you saw at the start of my very first slide, we spoke about appraisals and about performance improvement plans. Now, the reason that we split that is because the general definition of performance management is a process that starts with some goal settings or a starting point. And at some future date, there is broadly one of two conversations. We either talk to the people about how they're doing well and how to improve, or we talk to the people about they're not doing so well and we need to look at that more clearly. So I'm going to talk about that first conversation as the appraisal and the second conversation as the difficult conversation or the performance improvement plan. And before I continue, I'd just like to quote Ken one last time. He says in his text, evaluations or performance appraisals, are mouldy because they concentrate on the employee. As managers, many of us have spent long hours filling out these report cards, fully aware that our good employees will come in and be rock stars and our bad employees are going to come in and be marginally adequate at best, no matter how we score each group. And I'm so passionate about that, that 
comment, and I see so much evidence to support it. And that's why the three of us are here today sharing our approach to try to overcome that problem. So here are some statistics that I've collated over the years. That appraisal process just doesn't work. The stats are in. This is not debatable, it's science, the stats are in. And when we talk about the difficult conversation or the performance improvement plan, it's almost as bad. Again, all my physical and anecdotal evidence says people agree with these numbers. It's, people avoid the difficult conversation because you end up in court. And the improvement plans are actually designed or used on the 2% who don't care anyway, so no wonder it fails. But I'd just like to point out that when we're talking about the difficult conversation, we're also talking about much more than just performance. It's a whole bunch of other stuff over the side. And here's the really, really scary bit. The amount of time, effort and energy that organisations put into either helping people improve, brackets above that line, for almost zero results, or dealing with the two percenters below the line is broadly about 80% of your salary budget. That's a phenomenal amount of money to be spending on something that just does not work. So let me share with you how I approach it, which is akin to the other two, but slightly different. First of all, we like the idea of widgets, so we argue that there should be a widget for the good employees. There is the factory, the people involved, the line manager and their employees. In our case, a bit like Tim, we pre-script the conversation so that it is very clear the manager doesn't have to guess what to talk about. The outcome is about continuous improvement and a better future. Now, interestingly for me anyway, I argue the customer is actually not the employee, which is something Ken said in his text. I argued the customer in other words, who is using the information from this process? And I argue it's the leadership team or the CEO because they're the ones that need to take that data and start looking at training plans or remuneration reviews and corporate issues such as those. And I've said this to a few CEOs and they agree with me. So I think let's think about who is the customer and have a think about how we can make the widget, the actual process, a lot better. So here's an example of how we do it. it Maybe a bit difficult for you to see on the screen, but that's okay. On the left is our data entry screen, slightly different to the one that Tim uses. On our right is the output. So you can see that we look at the key criteria that the organisation needs. In this case, things like initiative diversity procedures. But interestingly, on the left-hand side, on this example, which is for a uh, admin role in a school, there are three options. So the line manager simply selects the first option and we automatically can generate that in the report to say that that just means satisfactory. Or if they select the second option, in this case, they can be satisfactory and identifying improvements. And in the third level, they would be satisfactory and identifying improvements and also initiating activity. Now the point is, this approach in our experience allows the, the people in the factory, the line manager employee, to have a conversation using those conversation notes. But it allows us to give the information to the CEO to say, hey, you've got 10 people that need to work on their initiative, or 16 people that are not really following their procedures properly. That's how we can communicate to both those groups. Here's where we've applied that approach and there's the evidence of how it's worked. I'll have to skip on fairly quickly but I do want to focus on the on the third case represented. Yes that is Mongolia. It is the Mongolian Public Service and we delivered the approach I just showed you in Russian Cyrillic to Mongolia out of our office here in Brisbane. It's doable. The second widget we argue, is for the two percenters, the people that don't want to play ball, the difficult ones that don't want to be at work. And you'll notice that we've shifted the people in the factory. We argue strongly it's no longer the employee at this point. 
we need the line manager and HR to get together and build the widget. We want to really be very clear about how we write the difficult conversation. And I'll show you an example of that in the tick. Now, once again, we argue that the outcome of that documented plan is not the employee, it's the lawyer. And let me explain why. If you have a difficult employee situation and you have a discussion and document something, if the, if the situation resolves itself, the paperwork goes on file, no one cares less. Now, whether that's the employee returning to be a good employee or whether they exit and resign. The paperwork is only required if it goes pear-shaped. So our argument is we need to build this widget in a way that is going to help protect the organisation, defend its management actions when the paperwork goes to the lawyers. Very different way of thinking about it. So here is our methodology. Um, uh, you can grab, I think it's actually this copy, off our website under the resources tab. But we actually start with the problem. We don't blame people. So in this case, the problem is when this employee, Bill, is late, Penny, the boss, can't allocate the work to the, to the rest of the team. But if that's the problem, it needs to be defended by the evidence. So you can see that we have a conversation where we're going through checking that Bill and everybody else present agrees that this has happened, including down the bottom at 1.3, literally in this case, 40 minute conversation about being late. And finally, we then engage Bill, the employee, in helping to come up with a solution to the manager's problem. And we found that that's worked very, very successfully once again across a range of industries, across a range of work categories, and with incredibly good statistics to support the approach. So where have we used this idea of two widgets? Here are just a sample of some organisations that we've had, including Mongolia in the middle of your screen. And I'd like to very quickly comment on a, a guy named Nick Holly, who's the Professor and Director of the Henley Business School Centre for HR Excellence in the UK. And of this approach, Ken made the comment to us. I think it's a far superior approach to most as it focuses on what the actual problem is, dealing with the two percenters without the IR legal risk. That's what annoys me about HR, says Nick. It's full of solutions looking for problems rather than working out what the actual problem is we're trying to fix. If we focus on that, HR can become a true business partner rather than a function everyone wants to see as irrelevant. So I've tried to very quickly in the last 15 minutes or so to share with you our approach. We're not throwing out appraisals and saying they don't exist. There are people arguing that case. We believe there is that need to collate that information for corporate needs and we use conversation notes. We certainly get fairly critical of the current methodology of performance improvement plans because the evidence is it doesn't work. And we encourage people to look at the management problems that are created rather than focus on the employee and the employee's bad behaviour or poor performance. So I hope you've achieved something out of that very quick snapshot. And once again, I want to thank uh, Wally and Tim personally for the three of us getting together and sharing these ideas with you. And I'll now hand back over to Tim. Thanks, Mark. I just, uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, your commentary there around the business of uh, of the customer, and uh, I, I'd just be keen if you could just talk a little bit. I, you mentioned a couple of times there that um, when we do performance reviews, we lose sight of who the customer is. Could you just talk a little bit about that because I found that very interesting. Certainly, and I appreciate the opportunity. The concern I have is. And I've, as I said, I've discussed this with CEOs of a number of organisations. And they talk about their process, you know, they're frustrated because they don't know what's going on. They're not getting timely information. They may have a six or ten page form, be it electronic or paper based. And I say, well, do you ever get a report on this stuff? 
and they go, oh, three or six months later, in which means it's too late. Mm. And I say, do you do anything with that information? And they go, no, I can't use it. It's, it's sort of irrelevant to me. And yet here are the people signing off on the policies and procedures and actually telling their staff to spend their time, effort and energy in a process that they sit back and go, what the? It really seems we've got to start with them and say, if they need the information as the customer, then let's go back to the widget and say, how can we make it as easy as possible to give the CEO the information they need because they're not doing the work. The employees and the managers are doing the work. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, folks, if you've got any questions and you'd like them to be answered, I'd suggest you go put your fingers to the keyboard and start typing in on the right-hand side because that's exactly what we're dealing with now, questions and answers. And uh, Wally, I've got a question here for you. Um, Wally, what are your thoughts about linking remuneration with your CPIP approach? Are you able to, you there Wally? Yes, I am. Yes, thank you. And Yes, thank you. And uh, don't do it. Next question. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't mean to be so quick there. <laughs> but uh, connecting remuneration with uh, performance appraisal is, is a serious, serious risk because you get unintended consequences and there's dozens and dozens of stories. In fact, the most recent one is uh, Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo just fired 5,000 of their employees. Now, why did they fire 5,000 employees? Because they, they tied setting stretch goals to remuneration to achieve those goals and they put tremendous pressure on the employees to achieve those goals. They had to open up new accounts with, it, with uh, customers. And what they did in order to meet the goals, they cheated and opened up accounts that the customers never ordered and then charged the customers and then they were discovered, of course. Now, uh, what they did was they fired the employees, but just as I was mentioning the word sugar and uh, wanting to blame the clerk, they uh, put pressure on people to uh, meet the goals and then they fired them when they met the goals. And so it, it's the same exact model and it's, it's a control technique. It's not an orchestra. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's consistent with the uh, authoritarian a pyramid approach to organizations where they attempt to control you and uh, and that's all it is. So you have to have another system of remuneration for people and ideally it's a team-based approach because it's the team that helps to deliver the results because it's the quality of the interactions between the team that makes the beautiful music of the orchestra. Right. Thank you, Wally. Yeah, in other words, separate them. Thank you. Mark, there's a question here for you. Uh, why do you think your approach has generated such positive results? Any hypotheses I hear from your employees that they really like to get a rating as they feel satisfied that they're doing a good job. How do we shift those to the desired type of pat on the back feedback to transition to the interaction-based conversation? Great question. Mark, are you able to respond to that? Yes, thank you for the question. And the question contained two comments which I'd like to split. It said people want a rating for a pat on the back or people want a rating to know how they're going. I would argue there is the conflict. They don't want a rating, they want feedback and you've seen through the three presentations today that none of us use numbers and that's deliberate on our three parts. I use behavioural anchor statements, they're technically called, Tim uses open-ended questions and sorry Wally I <laughs> can't quite remember the, the format <laughs> of yours in detail but we avoid numbers and we avoid ratings and my, my fantastic story was many years ago 
I walked into an organisation and almost the first thing I got told in this topic was an employee said, I only got a 4.2 out of 7, not a 4.3. Why? And that to me is the essence of what's wrong and that's what I've tried to address. You give feedback by using words and language and if you need numbers for corporate needs, you bury them and hide them. And that I hope is answering your question. Well done, Mark. Um, Wally, another question here for you. Um, what are your thoughts on the 2% concept that Mark spoke about and how might it apply to your, uh, your solution? Oh, I, I love that. I love the 2% mark uh, because uh, it, it, we see that in organizations, you especially see it in government. Uh, one person makes a mistake, so they create this bureaucracy. And um, the, the process that I have in place is the white flag. The two percenters are the ones who cannot keep their agreements. They cannot self-manage. They uh, spend on credit cards beyond the policy, or they don't come to work on time. Those are two basic agreements that uh, people should be able to keep. So when people have a, a pattern of poor performance, what's a poor performer? A poor performer is the two percenter. What's a poor performer? It's a willful breaking of integrity. So when you have a willful breaking of integrity, you document it and then you say goodbye. They're asking to leave. You just have to help them. You have to point them in the direction of the door. There's the door over there. You're asking where the door is. There it is. Please leave. Uh, uh, because that's really what the two percenters are. They're, they're willful breakers of agreements. Right. Thank you, Wally. Brilliant answer. I've got a question here. Um, Tim, do the, do the conversations of the five conversation framework really last 10 minutes? Well, they can last as long as you like. In fact, uh, you can you can go for as long as you like. And sometimes it mightn't be a bad idea to have a conversation that might be longer than normal. But the conversations themselves have been designed for to be lasting approximately 10, 15 minutes. So the idea is uh, we know that if we design them to be an hour long, doesn't necessarily make them any more productive and, 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 it, and it makes it a very good excuse not to do it. So we want to get people doing this and what Mark was talking about, feedback. Uh, we want, people want feedback. They desperately want to know how they're going but they don't want a number necessarily, they want feedback. So they do, do, they do go for 10 to 15 minutes uh, but sometimes, as I said, they can go longer and it may well be appropriate that that, that happen. But uh, so, yeah, it's designed to be pretty much, uh, you know, two or three questions and for the employee to come there having thought carefully about the responses. All right, well, look, I don't see any other questions there, so I'd like to thank those people who are in the audience. Uh, we had a very big group uh, in the audience uh, registered for this webinar, so thank you very much. I hope you've got something useful. We've still got a lot of people online, so you're clearly engaged. Uh, we also would be very welcoming of you asking us questions directly, and, uh, and uh, this afternoon I'll be sending out some details uh, regarding contacting details around who to talk to, and also you'll get the slides and the recording. So thank you very much. Thank you, Wally. Uh, I know it's late over there in the States and uh, we, <laughs> we, we do have, uh, we do have uh, the coffee brand that you talk about. It's on every corner of every, every street. <laughs> oh, you do? There you go. Okay, I need some. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might need a cocktail. Anyway, <laughs> Mark, thank you. Um, enjoyed working with you and, and thanks for uh, being the catalyst for putting all this together and thank you ladies and gentlemen and uh, that's the end of the broadcast.